Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, after one of the most intense storms ever to make a landfall, Hurricane Michael, now what? The U.S. moves down on a major indicator of food security. Another case of chronic wasting disease in deer found in Mississippi. And we meet a man who, after only six years, is logger of the year. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us today on Farm Week. As we now know, Hurricane Michael surprised many with its rapid buildup just before making landfall. The fallout from that storm plagues the country as the south digs out while portions of the Midwest impatiently wait for drier conditions. President Trump visited FEMA sites in the Sunshine State this week, surveying the damage caused by Hurricane Michael. Trump distributed water to victims as they returned to their homes one week after the Category 4 storm pummeled the Florida Panhandle. Hurricane Michael took more than 35 lives across the region and destroyed what was expected to be a bumper crop for southern cotton growers. The Georgia Department of Agriculture is predicting the cotton crop will be a total loss. This is similar to the pounding Texas cotton growers took from Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Peach State pecan producers suffered setbacks for the third year in a row. Starting with Matthew in 2016, a hat trick of hurricanes has reduced pecan crops by at least one third annually. Vice President Mike Pence toured areas where Michael caused significant damage to Georgia commodities. This represents generational loss to see uh, these uh, uh, four year old pecan trees down right about the time that they were getting close to producing, taking 10 years to get all the way back. U.S. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue pledged the full support of the USDA for those impacted by Hurricane Michael. South Carolina producers joined the group of those affected by the storm, losing 70 percent of their cotton crop. Soybeans, peanuts and fruit crops also suffered damage, bringing the total to a statewide loss of $125 million. The overall agricultural price tag for Michael's wrath is predicted to be over $1.3 billion. In the Lone Star State, torrential rains washed out bridges and forced disaster declarations in 18 counties as the Llano River rolled over its banks. Heavy rainfall has soaked the area, making rescue efforts difficult. The Lower Colorado River Authority is opening floodgates to alleviate flooding around the town of Llano. Forecasters are predicting an additional one to two inches of rain in the area over the weekend. In the Midwest, farmers are finally getting back into the field. A long stretch of wet weather has kept the harvest of corn and soybeans behind the five-year average. From market to market, I'm John Torpy. If all goes as expected, the president will put into place three new trade agreements with Japan, the EU, and the UK. The U.S. Trade Representative's office made it official just a few days ago, telling Congress that the administration will begin negotiating within 90 days. Goals for each plan will publish soon, but the USTR says the combined trade with those countries totaled a little over $1.7 trillion in 2017. Meanwhile, the president has asked each of his cabinet secretaries to reduce their department's budgets by 5%, calling it his nickel plan. The president met with his cabinet members. Government spending was his target, most, uh, most likely a way to pay for tax cuts that have driven the federal deficit a bit higher. He said he felt that everyone in his cabinet could meet the request, some more easily than others. I would like you to come back with a... Uh, 5% cut, get rid of the fat, get rid of the waste, and I'm sure you can do it. I'm sure everybody at this table can do it. It'll have a huge impact. Reaction to the call for the cut has been largely positive. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue said he thinks the USDA may be able to exceed expectations. 
As most know, forestry and logging, two of the biggest ag industries in the nation. Recently, the Mississippi Forestry Association held its annual awards, honoring many across those industries. The MFA was founded in 1938. In Mississippi, with more than 19 million acres involved, forestry is the number two industry, producing a billion and a half dollars in revenue. Leaders got together to honor their own, among them the Logger of the Year, Drew Massey. As usual, he paid a humble tribute to his employees. My employees, they're truly the backbone of my operation. Um, they, without them, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. Um, they're, they're, they, perform, they work with the utmost integrity, and um, I, I really thank the world of all of them. You'll meet Drew in more detail later in the show, and next week you'll meet the Tree Farmer of the Year. A recently released study blames the trade war, at least in part, for declining international food security. The study is called the 2018 Global Food Security Index. The study is from the Economist Intelligence Unit and says that climate change and trade tariffs are leading to factors that are raising prices, hitting low-income consumers the hardest. The U.S. was the most food secure country in the world for five years, from 2012 through 2016. Last year, the U.S. slid to second on the index. This year, it slid again to third behind Singapore and Ireland. Pork processing line speeds have been a bone of contention since a recent proposal to remove limits in the name of productivity. We reported on that in July. U.S. meat workers are three times more likely to suffer serious injuries than the average American worker, suffering amputations and other injuries. Now the USDA may be rethinking the idea. So far, it's received more than 83,000 comments on the proposal. Pork plants are currently limited to processing 1,100 hogs an hour. Unless withdrawn, the proposal would remove that limit altogether. Another deer in Mississippi has tested positive for chronic wasting disease. According to the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, this is the second deer found with this disease fatal to white-tailed deer. The state is encouraging hunters to voluntarily submit samples for testing. On the gardening side, with the chill we've had lately, you might feel doomed to end the season without much color in your landscape. But next year, it doesn't have to be that way. Here's Gary Bachman with an answer to the challenge of choosing annuals that produce all the way through summer into fall. Today's Southern Gardening is at the North Mississippi Research and Extension Center in Verona, taking a look at a planting that has really stood up to the heat of our summer. One of my first favorite flowers for the landscape were the narrow leaf, also called threadleaf zinnia, known botanically as zinnia angustifolia. These are the forebearers of the newer profusion and zahara zinnias. I think the compact and mounding growth habit is perfect for any landscape combination planting. These plants' white and orange flowers are produced in profuse numbers and brighten the garden. Purslanes are low-growing, spreading, flowering annual plants. Some of the better flowering purslanes, and there are many to choose from, include the colors rose, scarlet, orange, and yellow. The plants have a tropical look and put on a show with flowers up to one inch wide. The flowers will also close in the afternoon or on cloudy days. The bright yellow stamens are fairly long and will move with the gentlest touch adding more interest. The stems are purplish green and the leaves are bright green. They will grow up to eight inches tall and spread up to 18 inches. These were spaced about 12 to 15 inches apart when planted in the spring. Other plants that look good mixed throughout the planting bed include this nice dark scarlet petunia, purple angelonia, and white vinca. Choosing the right flowering summer annuals will pay off all the way through the fall season. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Time now for the markets with Leighton. I understand there's one crop in Georgia that hasn't been as damaged by the hurricane as most of the others. 
A little amazing fact, Mike, but true. We'll have more on that in a moment. Also, the latest supply demand report is called a mixed bag as far as soybeans. U.S. corn exports are helped by the claim it's the cheapest feed grain. And more cases of African swine fever add some support to hog prices. The big losses to the cotton industry from Hurricane Michael are becoming clearer. Analyst Jeff Thompson says on agfacts.com, he estimates a total of 1 million bales of cotton were lost to the storm in Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. The monetary loss to producers in those three states is now estimated to be $400 million. Well, much has been said about the hurricane damage to cotton and pecans two weeks ago, but what about Georgia peanuts? Well, an official with the National Peanut Association says there's actually still a surplus of peanuts after all the damage is calculated. Tyron Spearman says the storm obviously will reduce peanut production this year in the region, but, quote, not enough to affect prices. Larger ending stocks of U.S. corn and U.S. soybeans is one headline out of this month's USDA supply demand report. Josh Maples explains now why it was a mixed bag for the grain market. He begins his story describing the small changes to the corn numbers from a month ago. The yield estimate was decreased slightly, so that would suggest lower domestic production. However, uh, beginning stocks were revised and raised. So although we're expecting lower production, we have larger beginning stocks. You put those two together and we actually ended up with larger expected ending stocks. So that's why I'm calling it a mixed bag and, and not a lot in there to on either side. Tell me about the updated outlook for soybean production in the U.S. So soybean yields were bumped up just a little bit, just above 53 bushels per acre, which is a big number. Uh, so that would suggest more production. However, the estimated number of acres that are going to be harvested or that have been harvested was decreased. Uh, so actually production estimates, even with the larger yield, uh, are lower, but similar to corn, we've got larger beginning stocks than we had in September. So put all that together, uh, and again, we've got larger expected ending stocks and another mixed bag in terms of price outlook. And what was the story as far as U.S. cotton at this point? So cotton, larger uh, production and lower exports were the big changes from the September report. So uh, production increased 81,000 bales due mostly to increases in Texas and Georgia. Now those numbers were compiled before the crop losses due to Hurricane Michael in the southeast. The same report increased expected U.S. corn exports. Trader Tom Fitzenmeyer now describes how he sees this segment of the grains shaping up. I think you could see you could see corn work up another 10 or 15 cents. Um, you know they, they did bump exports a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now weekly exports this week were qu were really quite disappointing. Um, we've got really good export sales are high relative to a year ago, but a year ago weren't they weren't very good. So you aren't comparing that, that comparison. I'm not sure is valid um, in terms of what we need on a weekly basis to meet the USDA's projections. We're lagging behind. We've got the cheapest feed grain in the world in U.S. corn, so it should translate to good exports. Uh, I guess we'll have to see. It's time now for our trivia quiz on Farm Week. This week's question is about how Americans buy their food these days. Here is the quiz question. How many U.S. adults buy their groceries online now? Is the answer A, 17%, B, 26%, C, 35%, or D, 44%? We'll have that answer, of course, coming up a bit later. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, the U.S. has more than 750 million acres to forest land. In Mississippi, about 20 million acres. The value of all that timber has topped a billion dollars every year since 93. Needless to say, those who harvest all those trees have a big impact on the state's economy. You meet the MFA Outstanding Logger of the Year coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education. We care about their success and yours. Extending knowledge, changing lives. 
the MSU Extension Service. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, the MSU Row Crop Short Course, December 3rd through the 5th at the Cotton Mill Conference Center in Starkville. This conference is packed with 35 presentations, 16 of them from out-of-state speakers. Topics include entomology, plant pathology, weed science, agronomy, ag economics, and more. Continuing education units, license renewal, and recertification credits have been applied for and will be finalized once approved. Registration is actually free before November 27th and includes all meals, snacks, and drinks. Full information is online at extension.msstate.edu or call Kathy Johnson at 662-325-2701. Next, from January 8th through the 10th in New Orleans, it's the Beltwide Cotton Conferences. This is another packed convention on current research and emerging technology to improve production, processing, and marketing efficiency. More information next week, but visit the conference website at cotton.org beltwide. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. As the weeks roll on, African swine fever spreads further in China. The outbreak began mostly in northern and eastern provinces, but this week it is also being reported in the southwestern areas of China. 27 cities are reported to be affected so far. Trader Brian Roach says the evolving situation there should support U.S. hog markets. I don't see a lot of downside for the pork right now. Um, the uh, not we saw a couple more cases in China yep. today. I think something something a... new in Belgium. Uh, so so you know that plus we're shutting down a fair amount of production in the East Coast, mm -hmm. which I think keeps keeps things well supported. Um, and, then, and then also um, wholesale demand has perked up from very low levels. Uh, so the real trick here is to how how to play it. And, and one way you might look is the, you know, the October, December spread is typically, you know, minus 60 to plus 50 cents. Uh, that normally trades 350 to 450 to five. That might be something to look mm -hmm. at, but also look at February as a good place to start laying in some hedges. Our last stop of the week in the markets, the feeder cattle market, where prices kind of appear to be range bound. Trader Don Roos talks about what may be ahead here for the beef sector. Feeders, I still think, have a, a nice bid underneath of them because mm -hmm. of the cheap input costs. But I think when you have the feeders between uh, 160, uh, 155, 160, that's the upper end of the range just from a break-even standpoint. You can put a, a rate of gain on, or a pound of gain on for about 55, 60 cents. So I think that's a number that works. And we circle back to the trivia quiz to wrap up the markets. Our question again, how do you shop for food? And how specifically U.S. adults buy their groceries? How many buy them online? The answer is C, 35%. The survey was done in February. There are about 2.3 billion acres of land in the United States. Roughly a third of it is forest land. Needless to say, a good chunk of that land generates timber that we need for all kinds of things. The people who harvest that wood are known as loggers. One of them in Mississippi is the 2018 Logger of the Year. Meet Drew Massey. Timber, as far as the eye can see. For hundreds of years, Americans skilled in both harvesting and preserving our great forests have made logging their careers. In the process, providing homes, churches, schools, and every other wood-related product upon which we now depend. It's the kind of work that gets in your blood. The kind of work done every day by Mississippi's Logger of the Year, Drew Massey. Massey Timber is a young company, just six years old young like its owner, just 31. It's just a, a way of life, I guess. I, I really love being around nature and just being in the woods and um, the equipment. I, I, I love the equipment, and, um, something I've always had a passion for and just, um, I, I just, it's something I've loved to do my entire life and it's really all I've ever wanted to do, just, um, just being in the woods. Drew's dad owned a logging company. As a small child, Drew heaped dirt chunks for fun on job sites. His dad sold the company in 2010. Two years later, Drew, a born logger with his bachelor's and master's from Mississippi State, opened the company that would become his lifeblood and that of his crew members. 
Drew finds it hard to answer the question, how did you get so far in such a short time? I really have no idea. Um, I just, um, I'm very honored to have this, um, this honor so, so early in my career. Um, I, I never dreamed I, I would have, I would have um, been chosen for this award. Um, but I just will come out here every day and try to do uh, the best job we possibly can and um, try to portray for the public a good image of, of logging and uh, just uh, do what we love to do. That's amazing. That means he must be doing something right and handling stuff right. Roderick Miller is Drew's foreman. The two share everything about the company. He says he has complete faith in his boss, but that didn't stop him from smiling when the announcement was made. It was shocking, man. I ain't gonna tell you no tale. I read about other people, but never thought it'd be us. You know, it, it was a big, happy moment, you know. The guy's happy with it, I'm happy with it, and he showed sure up happy with it. He was butterflied up when he found out, I don't know if I'll get it, I don't know if I'll get it. I said, Drew, you're competing against big ones, but that don't mean they always win. I said, a small one could shine at some time. Virtually everything Massey Timber cuts these days is for Weyerhaeuser, one of the largest companies of its kind in the world. Jason Adams has been working with Drew for a year and a half. He says Drew was young, but he's solid. A, he's a little young for the logger. Most of the logging crowd's a little bit older, but uh, he's he's smart and he, he knows the business part of it really good, so it's, that's an asset to him. He can clear cut, thin, whatever we need. If we got a mill that we're running low on, he can, he can jump to a clear cut and he can do thin and he's just real versatile. With the logging industry the way it is, you have stuff that just changes at the last minute and we could have him plan to go do one thing and at the last minute, you know, talk to him and, you know, he'll go do something else for us, you know. And, and like I said, you know, with, when you have somebody that can thin or clear cut, it's just a big asset. You know, luckily he's second generation and so he's had experience most of his life and through his father. And so it, it's, it's just tremendous that he was able to, to get this company up and running at that young age. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic fantastic example of the young loggers we have in the state of Mississippi. There are roughly a thousand loggers in Mississippi, so it takes a lot to emerge at the top of the heap. And of course, the work itself is a blend of technique, technology, and a commitment to operating efficiently and productively. Work ethic is everything. Well, out here, it's very, it's very physically demanding. Um, not so much as it used to be years ago because the technology and the machines have increased, but just the sheer amount of hours and the, the um, technique that's involved with this um, harvesting equipment today you you uh, you really have to know what you're doing out here in order to operate in a productive and safe manner um, it's uh, it's very imperative that somebody's at uh, optimal optimal productivity at all times of course safety is no minor issue with all of this heavy equipment this crop of tall heavy unwieldy trees and the need to harvest as many of them as possible safety has to come first. Safety is such an important factor out here. It's, it's the top priority for us. Um, every, if I tell the guys all the time, if, uh, if, if we're safe, everything else will, will fall into place after that. Um, it's just all this, the large equipment and the harvesting of trees, it's one of the most dangerous, dangerous industries uh, that you can be in. And um, I, I just want the guys to be as safe as possible and go home the same way they came to the job. Drew's done a fantastic job on his time. If you walk to his job site, you can always see that he's got things put together in such a manner that it's easy to tell that safety is his number one priority. Uh, the quality of his work and how he treats uh, the land for whichever landowner he happens to be working for, it's just impeccable. And so we really think he's an outstanding uh, candidate uh, for this Logger of the Year. Those who nominated Drew for the honor of Logger of the Year say he shows a proactive approach to every aspect of his operation. From job site planning to production to safety, erosion control, equipment maintenance, and beyond. Ultimately, it's a huge responsibility. Forestry is important to all of us. It's important to our everyday life, just not only because of the fact that we are living in a land that is covered in forest, but also all the products that come from that for building, construction, homes, schools, churches, etc. And the logger is at the core of delivering that product to the mill that then processes it into lumber, furniture, etc. So the responsibility a logger has in tending to the forest natural nature's creation is so, so and very, very important. Good at best practices, pays attention to detail, proactive, committed to planning, 
These are all ways that the 2018 Logger of the Year, Drew Massey, has been described by those who work for and with him. At the end of the day, though, one of Drew's drivers seems to sum it up best, and quite simply at that. He deserves it. He worked hard for a young man. You know, he, 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 he worked hard for it. You know, he got us working hard for it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he deserves it. <laughs> His employees absolutely love him. A lot of respect there. And that's very evident in that story. <laughs> we'll respect a big part of the story next week, too, in our feature story about Mississippi's forestry industry. Nearly a million and a half truckloads of lumber came out of Mississippi forests in 2017. Forests, in fact, cover 65% of the state. And next time on Farm Week, a man who helps make all that possible. He's the 2018 Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year, as passionate about tree farming as he is history, and there's plenty of that to talk about. All that and much more next time on Farm Week. And before we go, a quick story. This goes back a ways. Food & Wine magazine reported that the Innovation Center of U.S. Dairy polled 1,000 people. 48% weren't sure, were not sure where chocolate milk comes from. 7% actually thought it came from brown cows. My extrapolation, that's more than 16 million people. So a lot of people still not sure where some of their food comes from. <laughs> Evidently, we have a lot of work to do. We sure do. <laughs> and remember, if you missed the story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week on our website, farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. <laughs>